Hello and welcome back to Build a CubeSat. I'm Manuel and today I'm going to tell you how I found the right batteries for my DIY satellite project. So what are we ideally looking for in a battery for space applications? Well, first and foremost, they should do well in a wide temperature range. I'm expecting from minus 10 degrees Celsius to plus 40. Um, they should be fairly robust to handle the stress during launch. They should of course have a high capacity and a high cycle count, meaning charge discharge cycles. And of course, they should be available and not too expensive. Interestingly, the CubeSat design specifications document doesn't state any further requirements for batteries other than additional documentation or testing would be required if they are non-UL listed cells. So we definitely want our cells to be UL listed. So as a quick sidebar, what does UL listed even mean? Well, the UL is a technical testing and certification organization that has been around since 1894. So the service they offer is that they inspect products, I think mainly consumer electronics, and make sure that they are safe enough to sell to the public. I think they are kind of like the TÜV that you may know if you live in a German-speaking country. So now that we broadly know what we are looking for, what could help us narrow down the search? Well, I think the easiest way is probably to first decide on a form factor where we get to decide between uh, prismatic, pouch and cylindrical. The other big aspect is deciding on a chemistry which is literally a science unto itself. So I think concerning the form factor it's going to be a relatively easy choice to make. Uh, pouch cells are only wrapped in this uh, thin foil and I think they're just not going to be robust enough for our application. Then prismatic cells are made to fit a very specific volume. This here is a replacement battery for my phone actually. So yeah, hooray for use replaceable batteries. Um, you can buy them individually in various shapes, but they tend to be kind of a bit more expensive. I have looked around a bit and I couldn't really find one that would fit our available volume very nicely. So that's probably also going to be a pass for us. So it's going to be cylindrical cells. These are actually um, from a Tesla Model 3 battery pack and that's just a random 18650 I had lying around. So the best choice here I think is to use cylindrical cells, mainly because there is a ridiculous amount of variety to choose from and also they are available all over the world for very reasonable prices. Of course, due to their shape, they don't fill out the available volume as well as a prismatic wood, but overall they tend to be a bit more energy dense, so I think they're still a better choice than a prismatic. Um, Size-wise, this here is a 18650, which is a very, very common size. And four of these next to each other will fit nicely in the 10 by 10 footprint of a CubeSat. A quick word about battery nomenclature. You will see various combinations of letters and numbers that describe batteries. For example, NCR21700 here, or INR18650. Um, and these describe um, the chemistry and the size. So I stands for lithium, N stands for nickel, and R for round, and 18650 are the dimensions. If I just grab my calipers here real quick. So it's uh, 18 millimeters in diameter, and from end to end it should be 65 millimeters, if I just, you know, really carefully Now choosing a chemistry is a bit more involved, so I made a quick pros and cons list of four available options. So up here in the first row we have lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt, which is a very common um, chemistry. I think when we talk about the lithium ion battery, that's what we mean most of the times. The next one is lithium iron phosphate, which is very common in larger battery packs like power walls and such. Um, lithium polymer is the third one which you will find in a lot of uh, consumer electronics that need to be really light, like maybe um, drones or cameras. And the last one is lithium titanate, which I had not heard of before making this video. What I have found is that most of them have a very similar operating temperature range, which is to the right here. But there's a bit of a caveat to this because yes, the cell will still deliver energy at minus 20 degrees Celsius, but significantly less of its total capacity will be um, available. 
So there is a kind of a um, temperature versus capacity um, graph to be to be made for each of those, and similarly a uh, temperature versus uh, charging rate graph because you can charge them as fast at very low or very high temperatures. And you may even degrade their performance uh, permanently when trying to charge below zero degrees Celsius. The big exception here is the lithium titanate one, which has a massive temperature range for both charging and discharging. But due to this being, I think, a rather new technology and I didn't find many vendors for it, um, I'm not really considering those. Also, their cell voltage is really low at 2.4 volts versus like 3.6 for most of the other ones. And their capacity is also not great. So I think this may be an exciting technology in the future, but for the moment I would like to go with something more proven. The lithium polymer one I think is also not a great choice for this because they're not that robust and they may start to burn when they're damaged or burst when they're overheated. So that's something we would like to avoid. So that's also not an option. Now, lithium iron phosphate is a great option, mainly due to their stability, um, safety and uh, long cycle life. Although they do have a bit of a lower cell voltage at 3.2 volts versus 3.6 volts for the uh, regular lithium ion ones. Quick side note here, there are also lithium cobalt batteries with some high performance, but cobalt mining is often linked to deeply atrocious working practices often involving child labor in the DRC, so we would want to use as little cobalt as possible. Lithium manganese would be an option too, but I have excluded them for their lower capacity. So now that we finally know which form factor and chemistries we are looking for, we can finally start searching. My first idea was to go to the UL website where you can actually make a free account and, you know, basically access all of their data for a few days at least. But if you just search for 18650 here, you'll quickly find that uh, you get kind of a lot of results and they are not that helpful at all. So that turned out to be a bit of a dead end because I think to find something relevant in this UL database you already need to know the part number or model you're looking for and then you can confirm that it, it is actually UL certified. So the next thing I did then was to just randomly search around for low temperature 18650s and I found this one from Nightcore which I think is a maker of flashlights um, that claims to be a um, high performance low temperature 18650 um, but it's it's obviously a consumer product so I didn't really find a, you know a data sheet or anything for it and also at 30 bucks each it's a bit it's a bit expensive at some point I then remembered that NASA actually publishes most of their research so I went to their site with the lovely name scientific and technical information compliance and distribution services where they have a link to their technical report server. Here I just naively searched for 18650, then sorted by newest publication date, and also filtered by 18650 in the title. After skipping some interplanetary and novel chemistry related stuff, I found this delightful presentation by Krause et al. from 2019 called Commercial 18650 Lithium Ion Cells for High Energy, High Power and Radiation Appliances, which, let me tell you, is just a thing of beauty. The authors who seem to work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, or JPL, start off by giving a quick recap of 18650 use in NASA missions, including the upcoming Europa Clipper, which I find utterly mind-blowing. And then they list eight cells that are up for comparison. They really go in depth by dissecting the cells, measuring their anodes and cathodes, and determining their composition through X-ray diffraction analysis, which I don't understand much about. What I do get from this table is that none of these are lithium iron phosphate. So, because I would really like to base my decision on the information contained in this presentation, that's another eliminated option. What follows is some really thorough testing of each of the cells in various temperature and radiation scenarios. And thankfully a last slide containing their conclusions, stating that the LG-MJ1 cell appears to offer the most favorable combination of energy, cycling stability and high rate capability up to 10 amps. Also an interesting side note here that is that the effect of radiation up to 20 millirad is relatively minor, so I don't know yet which, what are we dealing with in low Earth orbit, but that's definitely a good thing to know. 
So there we have it, a specific manufacturer and part number that will absolutely fit the bill for a CubeSat in low Earth orbit. And this is something that makes me kind of happy. After a quick search, I also found a data sheet that lists the nominal capacity at 3500 milliamp hours and the nominal voltage at about 3.6 volts. I think I will use four of these in a 2S2P configuration, so that means two in series and two in parallel for a battery pack that will supply 7 amp hours at 7.2 volts. So that's about 50 watt hours, which I hope will be enough. Uh, my reason for doing two in series is that this way I can only use buck converters to go to 5 volts and 3.3 volts instead of using buck boost converters, which I think will simplify the EPS design a bit. Now armed with all this information and an actual part number, we can go back to the UL website and search for INR18650 MJ1. And if we continue searching for the MJ1 um, part number, we will eventually find the UL certification for this battery. Note here that the INR variant is definitely the one we want because the LCO is the one with uh, the lithium cobalt chemistry. Having checked that requirement, we can proceed to sourcing and seeing if they are actually available and affordable. And simply by going to batteryjunction.com and searching for MJ1, we see that they are indeed available. And at $5.95 per piece, they are also a reasonable price. So that's definitely a winner. I am sure that they are also available from different vendors. Uh, my local vendor here in Switzerland, for example, SwissBet has them as well stocked at a somewhat higher price of uh, 11 Swiss francs, which equates to about 10 or $11. So there we go. Thanks to NASA and to JPL, it was actually kind of easy to source a battery that will definitely work well for this cube set. And uh, as luck would have it, I actually found four of those among my random electronic stuff. That's, these are these exact cells, the LG MJ1. I think I bought them a few years ago for a different project, but I will now definitely use them to prototype the EPS. I also looked around for a coin cell in case I'm going to need one to power an RTC, which again, going back to the CDS, is allowable. Um, this was a much less involved process. I just googled around for something like low temperature 2032 and I pretty quickly found these maxil lithium manganese dioxide cells that are also rechargeable and have a nominal temperature range from minus 20 to 60 degrees celsius. They have a 65 milliamp hour capacity and are also UL listed which again we can go verify in the UL database. They come in a variety of packages. I'll probably go for this T25 package with welded on terminals for through hole soldering, but without a protective sleeve as we want to use as little plastics as possible. And again, these are also readily available at a reasonable price. Oh, and by the way, the numbers here also describe the dimensions of the cell. So this is a 2018, which means that it's 20 millimeters in diameters, and it should be 1.8 in thickness. The 65 milliamp hour capacity seems like not so much, but actually modern um, RTCs, uh, so real-time clocks, use very little power in the range of a few nanoamps. So I will want to pick an RTC I see that will um, use little enough power so that it will be running for at least half a year to a year, because you never know um, how long your CubeSat is going to wait for the launch after integration. That's probably a bit on the cautious side, but you know, better safe than sorry in this case. Actually having to wait for the launch too long is what caused most of the CubeSats on board the Artemis 1 mission to fail, but in that case their uh, main batteries just drained after a while. That's all I have for you today, and in the next episode we are going to look at how I started designing a place for these batteries to live, which is the EPS battery compartment. Thank you much for watching, let me know if you like this episode and I will see you in the next one.